Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Tuesday, July 28th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way, kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil, and save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they make, they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me and see. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Acts chapter 23. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than forty who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now, therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case more exactly, and we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you, as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and, going aside, asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But not, do not be persuaded by them, for more than forty of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, Tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Then he was called... Then he called two of the centurions and said, Get ready two hundred soldiers with seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Claudius Lysaeus to His Excellency the Governor Felix Greetings this man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the next day they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with them. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from, and when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. The Book of Concord reading tonight 
is from the Augsburg Confession on worship of the saints, on the importance of offering both kinds in the sacrament, and on the marriage of priests. Article 21, Worship of the Saints. Our churches teach that the history of saints may be set before us so that we may follow the example of their faith and good works according to our calling. For example, the emperor may follow the example of David, 2 Samuel, in making war to drive away the Turk from his country, for both are kings. But the scriptures do not teach that we are to call on the saints or to ask the saints for help. Scripture sets before us the one Christ as the mediator, atoning sacrifice, high priest, and intercessor, 1 Timothy 2, 5-6. He is to be prayed to. He has promised that he will hear our prayer, John 14, 13. This is the worship that he approves above all other worship, that he be called upon in all afflictions. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, 1 John 2-1. This, then, is nearly a complete summary of our teaching. As can be seen, there is nothing that varies from the Scriptures or from the Church Universal or from the Church of Rome as it is known from its writers. Since this is the case, those who insist that our teachers are to be regarded as heretics are judging harshly. There is, however, disagreement on certain abuses that have crept into the Church without rightful authority. Even here, if there were some differences, the bishops should bear with us patiently because of the confession we have just reviewed. Even the Church's canon law is not so severe that it demands the same rights everywhere, nor, for that matter, have the rights of all churches ever been the same. Although, in large part, the ancient rites are diligently observed among us, it is a false and hate-filled charge that our churches have abolished all the ceremonies instituted in ancient times. But the abuses connected with the ordinary rites have been a common source of complaint. They have been corrected to some extent, since they could not be approved with a good conscience. A review of the various abuses that have been corrected. Our churches do not dissent from any article of faith held by the Church Catholic. They only admit some of the newer abuses. They have been erroneously accepted through the corruption of the times, contrary to the intent of canon law. Therefore, we pray that your Imperial Majesty will graciously hear what has been changed, and why the people are not compelled to observe those things that are abuses against their conscience. Your Imperial Majesty should not believe those who have tried to stir up hatred against us by spreading strange lies among the people. They have given rise to this controversy by stirring up the minds of good people. Now they are trying to increase the controversy using the same methods. Your Imperial Majesty will undoubtedly find that the form of doctrine and ceremonies among us are not as intolerable as these ungodly and ill-intentioned men claim. Besides, the truth cannot be gathered from common rumors or the attacks of enemies. It can easily be judged that if the churches observed ceremonies correctly, their dignity would be maintained and reverence and piety would increase among the people. Article 22, Both Kinds in the Sacrament The laity are given both kinds in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper because this practice has the Lord's command, Drink of it, all of you. Matthew 26, 27. Christ has clearly commanded that all should drink from the cup. And lest anyone misleadingly say that this refers only to priests in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, Paul cites an example. From this it appears that the whole congregation used both kinds. This practice has remained in the church for a long time. It is not known when or by whom or by whose authority it was changed. Cardinal Cusanus mentions the time when it was approved. Cyprian, in some places, testifies that the blood was given to the people. Jerome testifies to the same thing when he says the priests administer the Eucharist and distribute the blood of Christ to the people. Indeed, Pope Galasius commands that the sacrament not be divided. Only a recent custom has changed this. It is clear that any custom introduced against God's commandments is not to be allowed, as church law bears witness. This custom has been received not only against the scripture, but also against old canon law and the example of the church. Therefore, if anyone preferred to use both kinds in the sacrament, they should not have been compelled to do otherwise, as an offense against their conscience. Because the division of the sacrament does not agree with the ordinance of Christ, it is our custom to omit the procession with the host, which has been used before. Article 23, The Marriage of Priests 
Complaints about unchaste priests are common. Platina writes that it is for this reason that Pope Pius is reported to have said that although there are reasons why marriage was taken away from priests, there are far more important reasons why it should be given back. Since our priests wanted to avoid these open scandals, they married wives and taught that it was lawful for them to enter into marriage. First, because Paul says, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and it is better to marry than be aflame with passion. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 and 9b. Second, Christ says, not everyone can receive this saying, Matthew 19, 11, where he teaches that not everyone is able to lead a single life. God created human beings for procreation, Genesis 1.28. It is not within a person's power without God giving a unique gift to change this creation. For it is clear, as many have confessed, that no good, honest, chaste life, no Christian, sincere, upright conduct has resulted from the attempt to lead a single life. Instead, a horrible, fearful unrest and torment of conscience has been felt by many until the end. Therefore, those who are not able to lead a single life ought to marry. No human law, no vow, can destroy God's commandment and ordinance. For these reasons, the priests teach that it is lawful for them to marry wives. It is clear that in the ancient church, priests were married men. For Paul says, an overseer must be the husband of one wife. 1 Timothy 3.2 400 years ago, in Germany, for the first time, priests were violently forced to lead a single life. They offered such resistance that when the Archbishop of Mainz was about to publish the Pope's decree about celibacy, he was almost killed in a riot by enraged priests. This matter was handled so harshly that not only was marriage forbidden in the future, but existing marriages were torn apart, contrary to all laws both divine and human. It was even contrary to canon law itself, as made not only by popes but also by the most celebrated synods. Seeing that man's nature is gradually growing weaker as the world grows older, it is good to be on guard to make sure no more vices work their way into Germany. Furthermore, God ordained marriage to be a help against human weakness. Canon law itself says that the old rigor ought to be relaxed now and then in these later times because of human weakness. We wish this would also be done in this matter. We expect that at some point churches will lack pastors if marriage continues to be forbidden. While God's commandment is in force and the custom of the church is well known, impure celibacy will cause many scandals, adulteries, and other crimes that deserve punishment from just rulers. In light of all of this, it is incredibly cruel that the marriage of priests is forbidden. God has commanded that marriage be honored. Marriage is most highly honored in the laws of all well-ordered commonwealths, even among the heathen. But now men, even priests, are cruelly put to death, contrary to the intent of canon law, for no other reason than that they are married. Paul in 1 Timothy 4 says that a doctrine of demons forbids marriage. Verses 1-3 to This is clearly seen by how laws against marriage are enforced with such penalties. Since no human law can destroy God's command, neither can it be done by any vow. So Cyprian advises women who do not keep the promise they made to remain chaste, that they should marry. He says, if they are unwilling or unable to persevere, it is better for them to marry than to fall into the fire by their lusts. They should certainly give no offense to their brothers and sisters. And even canon law shows some leniency toward those who have taken vows before the proper age, as has been the case up to now. And tomorrow evening we will continue our reading of the Augsburg Confession with Article 24 on the Mass and Article 25 on Confession. And today is the day the LCMS commemorates the life of Johann Sebastian Bach. Johann Sebastian Bach lived between 1685 and 1750 and is acknowledged as one of the most famous and gifted composers in the Western world. Orphaned at age 10, Bach was mostly self-taught in music. His professional life as conductor, performer, composer, teacher, and organ consultant began at age 19 in the town of Arnstadt and ended in Leipzig, where for the last 27 years of his life, he was responsible for all the music in the city's four Lutheran churches. In addition to being a superb keyboard artist, the genius and bulk of Bach's vocal and instrumental compositions remain overwhelming. 
A devout and devoted Lutheran, he is especially honored in Christendom for his lifelong insistence that his music was written primarily, primarily for the liturgical life of the Church, to glorify God and to edify the people. We now join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time. For behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war, held as slaves and sacrifices of earthly wrath, may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness, and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful of the confession of your Son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace, that we may withstand all trials and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, beautiful in majesty and majestic in holiness, you have taught us in Holy Scripture to sing your praises and have given to your servant, Johann Sebastian Bach, grace to show forth beauty in his music. Continue to grant this gift of inspiration to all your servants who write and make music for your people, that with joy we on earth may glimpse your beauty and at length know the inexhaustible riches of your new creation in Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.